Hello and welcome to Innovation Celebration, the show where we celebrate recent advancements in science and technology, the people and ideas that make those possible, and the ways in which they enhance human flourishing. I'm Thomas Walkerworth, and this is my wonderful wife, Angelica Walkerworth. And today we're going to talk about something that a number of our previous innovations have touched on. Um, because a couple of times now we've talked about uh, you know, prosthetic limbs or solutions in construction or things like that that have relied on 3D printing. So we thought, seeing as we've done a number of episodes recently that are focused you know, entirely on one particular area, we thought maybe we'd do an entire focus on 3D printing. So it... Before we get started, though, I just wanted to make a quick note to our viewers. We had a question on our last episode about where some of the numbers that we were citing in our episode comes from. Sure. And so I just want to let you guys know that we do include most of our sources in the show notes. So yeah. if you're on YouTube, that'll be in the video description. If you're on the website, or you can visit objectivestandard.org under podcast, you'll find our podcast. And all of our, well, not all, but almost all of our sources are on there. And so any numbers that we're citing in the show as well as a bunch of the names and other facts and figures and more information will be found in those sources. Yeah, and when we you know we do research this stuff as heavily as we can, but obviously there's a limit to what the two of us can do between us. So, yeah. Um, yeah sometimes... This is not our only responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I think let's jump in with talking about how 3D printing works, because my understanding was that 3D printing is basically just layering different materials, usually plastic or metal, on top of each other. But you've told me that there are different methods... Yeah, um, so do you want me to jump in with Please that? Do, yeah. yeah, so um, it's, it goes right back to 1981. You know, we think of it as being a relatively recent technology, um, but the, the first steps towards developing the 3D printing that we know now actually go back to the early 80s. A Japanese researcher, I've got his name here, Hideo Kodama, um, was trying to develop what he called a rapid prototyping system. And, uh, and that was that first in you know, layer by layer manufacturing process that you're describing. Unfortunately, he never patented his process. Oh. Um, there was also a, a group of French researchers uh, working at the Université de Haute Alsace um, who also were developing a similar system. Uh, so basically, the idea is curing liquids into solids. So curing is the process where you take a, a material and harden it effectively. And, um, and this, was, this very early process was using what's called monomers. You've probably heard of polymers, as in plastics. Monomers are just very simple atomic structures that get layered to, well not layered, but combined together to form polymers. Polymers are you know, complex constructions of, of molecules. Uh, monomers are the, are the more simple ones that those are made out of. And so you know, their um, process was trying to use lasers to fuse those monomers together. And, and one, one of the techniques that's used nowadays is um, a, basically a development of that. So there are three main techniques used, like widespread techniques, and there's a couple of others I would like to mention as well. Um, but the first is stereolith stereolithography, okay. uh, invented by Charles Hull in uh, 1984. Uh, he was a furniture designer, but he was frustrated that he couldn't easily make fine parts. He wanted a process to be able to manufacture those components more easily and build these little 3D models. So um, that was where he came up with the idea of uh, curing photosensitive resin layer by layer using lasers. Uh, and then after that you had sensitive laser sintering, 19, uh, invented in 1988 by Carl Deckard. He was the first to actually patent a system. And, uh, and that's at the University of Texas and uh, he's using liquid polymers and so instead of the layer by layer, you're using a liquid and curing that into a solid. Neither of those is actually the most common process today because those are both quite expensive. They're good for detail, but if you want to do it more cheaply, then you don't want to be using lasers. As we've discussed before, <laughs> lasers are expensive. So the actual most common, the sort of commercial 3D printers you get nowadays are fused deposition modeling or FDM printers. Uh, and instead of using layers, lasers, sorry, you're just feeding the material directly out through a nozzle. Mm. So yeah, there's less precision with the FDM ones than there is with the SLA or the SLS, but it's much cheaper to produce. So um, anyway, I've, I've got a friend who has one who you know, made little bicycle tire hook things for us when we did a bike ride. Um, and you know they're kind of cool to look at and it's great for making little sculptures, but they were brittle and they lacked detail. And um, whereas the SLA and SLS machines can do the kind of precision engineering that you might need for more specific, complicated tasks. 
So. Sure. So that actually sounds like a really nice segue into some, some of the challenges for 3D printing. I would rather end with um, advancements because those are more fun. Uh, sure. So yeah, let's yeah. talk about challenges there's, now. So there's a couple of other techniques that I want to talk about, but we'll come to those as they come sure. up in discussion. Yeah. So um, one of the challenges, as you were saying, is that some of these methods are quite expensive. Um, purchasing the actual 3D printers for, say, industrial um purposes to build machine parts or whatever you might be manufacturing it's usually a um, a very expensive investment i think i read for the metal ones you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars um however that comes with the upside of you don't need to buy all of the tools that you would normally use to create those things so you're sort of trading off on costs there um another challenge is that only certain materials are suitable for uh 3d printing you talked about yeah. some polymers and things like that Yes, I say that's one of those other techniques I wanted to talk about. Go ahead. So yeah, um, well, because I say all of the ones I've been talking about so far have been plastic ones. There's, there's aside from the resin-based systems that I've talked about, um, there's there's two other groups of systems that I want to talk about. One is just simply trying to use ink jets, basically like a traditional two mm. D printer, rather than using lasers or um, or the uh, well, there's, yeah. So that's multi jet fusion. Uh, and then there's also a, uh, what's it called, digital light processing, which is using a digital light beam instead of a natural laser. Um, so those are just different ways of doing the plastic, but trying to either increase precision or reduce cost more. But what's really interesting is metal printing. And uh, I think that's what you were steering towards there, is you know manufacturing pieces using metal instead of plastic, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously a lot harder and a lot more expensive because metal is that much harder to control. But uh, you have direct met metal laser sintering, DMLS, which is reading off here because I forget these names, uh, and electron beam melting. Okay. Um, so uh, one is just the same sintering process using lasers, and then the another is using electron beam, both of which you, you're trying to mold metal. So yeah. you know, the power requirements there are enormous, but the advantage of being able to produce... It's like if anyone's seen the new Spider-Man movie, you know, they have that machine that can just manufacture any product. We're not quite there yet, but the ability to just, you know, input something into a computer and then have it create that out of metal rather than just out of this sort of you know, breakable plastic it is obviously you know, extremely useful. Yes, yeah, so you've touched on a couple of the other challenges I wanted to bring up actually, which is that most of the methods now available do actually consume a massive amount of energy. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, like tens to hundreds of times more than what would normally be used to create a product of the same weight and size. Um, but it does depend on the method from what I understand. Uh, and yeah. then, well, oh, the materials... Uh, some often to combat some of those problems you were talking about, like with things being brittle or not, just not of the right quality, you have to go through a po post-processing um, procedure with some of them. And so some manufacturers of 3D printers are just building that into the setup now, like we're going to sell you a 3D printer that will also do your post-processing. Right. Um, but they have to do things like sanding off edges or removing supports or uh, treating it with a particular material so that it doesn't warp depending on what they need so that it's the appropriate quality and depending on the material going in. Um, so basically what I'm saying is these are challenges, things like energy consumption and having to do post-processing, but people are working on the challenges. Yeah. Um, another challenge that people are working on that we touched on is that only certain materials are suitable for 3D printing. A group of scientists at MIT actually developed an AI program that is helping people test this faster. Um, so basically the way the program works is you input the it, um, properties of the material that you're interested in using and it will sort of fiddle with knobs and spit out what it thinks is the ideal uh, combination of those substances. And then you test it and then you give the, uh, the results of the test back to the AI and then the AI will get better at predicting yeah. how things work that's how an ai is supposed to function yeah so, so whenever i'm on a website and it's uh, one of those you know click all the squares that has a traffic light in it and i'm like well who's ai am i training here? <laughs> right but no um it, it which sort of brings me around to one of the important things to understand with 3d printing is that it's easy to imagine it being like a star trek replicator like you could just make anything but you have to remember that you do need to put in the material. It needs an input. To create. It's not really, it's not manufacturing things out of thin air. It's reforming an input into an output. So, uh, you know, you require, and usually you require, uh, you know, for the sort of basic commercial ones, this liquid resin or, or layered resin. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and you know, obviously the metal ones is another matter, but you know, if you can move towards, I mean, the resin is fairly easy to acquire, but again, it's you know, you, you end up constrained in what you can produce. You know, you can either, you can only manufacture things out of this one material, and it has either depending on the type of printer, it's either got strength issues or detail issues. So yeah, you know, trying to move towards other materials is is an important next step. But you know, we're nowhere near the stage of being able to you know re constitute air into an object or something yeah, you, you need to have that medium to put in, in the front to get in I think mm-hmm. um, reminded me of something but it's gone now um, <laughs> right so one of the other challenges sorry to go completely off there but I've forgotten what I was going to say so one of the other challenges that you get with this is that um, I've remembered in order to make some of those tweaks. So the idea of a 3D printer is that you can make tweaks quickly and be able to test things more quickly. Um, But in fact, you have to be able to program the printers and not very many people know how to do that just yet. Um, Some people are working on building software programs to make that easier, but... So that's interesting. My understanding was that you can... Or like you know, trade in blueprints. You can like, do like instruction sets. For yeah, to... but there aren't. They're not just floating around. You know, you can't go to the library and get a blueprint. Because well, right, this sort of touches on one of the challenges, doesn't it? Because I was reading a story about you know there being blueprints for weapons and things just kicking around on the internet that people can just download and I print. I don't think there home. are. Is that not actually the case? Was that just some fear mongering news think, article? Well, I think that's a hypothetical scenario to be mm. concerned about. That at some point there could be, but I don't think there are I right somebody now. Somebody did that for real, like tested it and fired one that they'd printed at home, like a gun they'd printed at home. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, I'll have to look that up and maybe we'll put something in the notes. Under yeah, if we can find that. That's actually true or not, because that may be hyperbolic. But, I'm but that sure. is a concern yeah. in the future. You know, I don't yeah. think that those blueprints are there right now, but they could be. Yeah. And then you could have people printing weapons at home. Again, that re- relies on people having the materials, because the thing is, can you get all the metal that you would need? And we were talking about the metal printers costing tens of thousands yeah. of dollars. How many people have that at oh, home? Yeah, at that point, just go buy a gun. A resin gun, <laughs> going to be. Uh, yeah. And the fact is, you know, if you if you have the know how, you can build a gun at home right now. If you want, if you had, if the, you had the, the equipment, and yeah, exactly. But, and so this I'm is always the thing with technology. It. Technology, you know, it opens new new opportunities, but all it's doing is leveling up our ability to do what we already do. To or, or you know, it, it's every it's, once in a while you get something that's brand new, but, but it doesn't adjust the balance between good people and bad people like because the, the technology is available to everyone and te- you know it, it moves it, it moves in step like you know for every you know new sort of you know hacking development there is there's a new cyber security development and for every you know way that a 3d printer might be used for harm it's probably more likely to be used for good and you know, so the sort of the general trend in, in history if anything is that technology reduces you know, the threat to human life overall and, and you know, threats to quality of life because mm. it improves people's access to resources and reduces the incentives to, to do crime and that kind of thing. Sure. But, you know, any technology event, somebody's going to find a way to misuse. But those, you know, for the two, for hundreds of years, people have been you know terrified of all the implications of these technologies. But, you know, yes. I'd much rather live now and have the risk of 3D, 3D printed guns going around than live 200 years ago when somebody could murder me and never be found out for it. Mm. You know, so I, you know, I think, long story short, is technology is pretty much always a, a force for good in the long run, mm-hmm. even if it does have these you know, legitimate concerns that you need to think around how you deal with. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But actually, you brought up one of the other concerns there, which is cyber attacks. Um, mm-hmm. Some companies are concerned about, and I don't know how. I don't know that this has happened yet, so maybe it's not a substantiated concern yet. But some companies considering three D printing technologies are concerned about, well, if we've got our software on an internet, could somebody hack that and use our three D printer for other things? Yeah. Um, which I suppose depends on your cybersecurity situation. Yeah, I mean, that's again, it's like an issue with any kind of computer network and whatever you've got on your computer network. It's the same issue with driverless cars. You know, can can people hack them? Mm. But again, you know, the, the the monumental benefits, clear, uh, to my mind, clearly outweigh that risk. So, given that we've actually covered most of the challenges, do we want to talk about some of those benefits now? Well, I, I first before we do that, just because you've t- started talking about the computer blueprints and and that you know, networking side of it, I wanted to mention just how that was an important historical development in, in the development of uh, 3D printing, because in the 80s, you know, it was one thing to develop the physical system for printing, but you didn't have the computer technology to design the blueprints. Mm-hmm. It was what we call CAD, computer-aided design, 
coming along in the 90s that actually really kick-started. That, together with a patent expiring on one of the technologies, was what really kicked off the, um, the modern growth. That patent expired in 2009. But it was, you know, having CAD in place by then, and I, mean, I worked with CAD at school, I don't, you know, for those who don't, you know, this is where you can build models in 3D simulated space. And, you know, trying to 3D print anything, you know, if you're hand drawing or you're trying to code indirectly, you know, what you're producing versus if you can build the thing in, in a 3D design software first and then just tell the machine, make this that I've just built in 3D space. You know, the, having that technology available kick-started 3D printing as, as being as actually we know possible. It. Yeah. yeah. Cause, uh, and, you know, that technology is just absolutely leaped ahead in the last 20 years or so. So the, 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 if, if you look at, I mean, I've been following projects to, um, you know, build machine, yeah, I, I've got an interest in engineering and, and you know, bridges and things like that, locomotives, all that sort of stuff. Nowadays, when you build, you know, where you pursue, previously you would have done a, a you know, pencil drawing or even a digital drawing of, you know, in two dimensions. Nowadays, you build this three dimensional CAD model first before you build anything in, in, in the real world. Which saves time. Real. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, this is a now we're at a point where you can build a component and then just tell it to print right there. And yeah. I think we talked about this on the show before, you know, that cuts out so much manufacturing time, you know, having to have it sent off somewhere and built, built machined traditionally. We talked about it with the rocket engines, didn't we, that were 3D yes. printed. It, you know, you can just tell the machine, like, all right, I'm done, make that. And we can see if it works, and if it doesn't, make it again with this thing changed. And it cuts out so much of the manufacturing process. So as I understand it, as the technology currently stands, depending on which method you're using, um, the main benefit there at the moment is vertical integration, is that you're doing it in-house as opposed to having to order it. Some For some parts, you're actually taking longer, like the machine takes longer than a person would to build it, but companies are rapidly working on that. So that time is decreasing like it's having every year. That's, at least. Yeah, that's a big part of the benefit. Yeah, it's also that ability to, to make things cheaply enough that you can make them again and again. Like if you, you order a part from a... Of supplier and it you know it comes a couple of weeks later and it's you know it's been machined by hand or whatever in you know, in this big plant and it's wrong and it doesn't work and you got to place another order for another one yeah if you just printed it off <laughs> and it's you know you, you can you can afford to print ten different ones with tweaks in the design and try them all you mm. can afford to make another one if if the first one doesn't work so it just not only does it make that manufacturing process easier. It makes you able to produce a better product quicker and you don't have to release your product and find out there's something wrong with it a couple months later. Well, and another point, um, another benefit is that it's more customizable, that you can make things precisely how you want them. Yeah. Um, which some people have been talking about potentially applying that to medical devices, making things like personalized for each patient. Yeah, one of the uses I've got noted down here is, is prosthetic limbs. I mentioned that at the start, like, you know, being able to... 3D print new arms for people or mm. you know hip bones for people that kind of thing again you know, it's it's kind of a few steps beyond where things are at, at the moment but yeah that's some one area where you know increasing the range of materials you can use would be very useful sure when you want materials yeah. that are going to be safe inside a human body mm-hmm. absolutely yeah um yeah okay <laughs> So I think that's have we covered everything you wanted to in terms of the benefits I think I I mean it's you know it, we've barely scratched the surface of the things you can do like no to, I want to get into that more as we're yeah. talking about some of that I have some advancements and yeah ways so do you want to go into those yeah. and that should hopefully open up some of those other sure. applications okay you know. yeah and then we'll summarize at the end yeah yeah okay so the first advancement that I wanted to talk about is so we've mostly been talking about three D printing with plastics and polymers and metals uh, which is the bulk of as I understand it, how it's being used, but you can also, certain people are experimenting with doing it with bacteria. So there's a team led by, I'm just going to check my notes here, a William Hines at the Lawrence Livermore, Livermore National Laboratory, which is a federal research facility in California. Um, and Hines and his team are 3D printing bacterial films um, in resins using LED lights. So I'm assuming this is using one of the light methods that you were mentioning at the using beginning. Using LED light? Yeah, they're using LED specifically. Uh, that sounds like digital light processing to me, but probably if it's I, you know, if I can't confirm yes. specifically. Um, and so the purpose of these and these bacteria films are super super thin. They're barely thicker than a human cell, um, but they're in a resin, the bacteria. And so the purpose that they've tested it for, successfully tested for, is that it can sense uranium and oh. other uh, and help with rare earth 
rare, rare metals um, biomining in the earth. Right. But so sen- sensing uranium for cleaning up radiation leaks or finding uranium to mine? I think finding uranium to mine right. is more so yeah. what they've Not experimented. Not presumably, but... I mean, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's what they've tested it for, is that can find uranium and other uh, rare metals so that you can mm. mine them. Um, they think it could also be used for helping to clean up wastewater and potentially for turning electricity into biofuels or chemicals. This is a thing I didn't know about before. There are certain bacteria that basically eat... Uh, electricity and produce biofuels or chemicals. I didn't that's, know this. That's <laughs> almost the reverse of what we were talking about with nuclear fusion having a, a, a usable fuel byproduct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but apparently, like, sometimes with uh, like with energy plants, you have surplus electricity that you can't properly store. Yeah. Or um, yeah, capacitors have a, have the, the limits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everything has their limits. So the idea is, well, let's not let any of that go to waste. Let's let these bacteria. Um, take that electricity and turn it into something else that we can use. So, so does that me clarify? Because I think I was something, sure. just in case anyone in the audience did as well, we're not 3D printing bacteria. We already have the bacteria, right. and we're yeah, 3D printing them a... into a resin. So you're basically almost like Jurassic Park style, like burying them in this in the resin. I mean, yes, but sort of, <laughs> because you're more suspending them in the resin, I would say, because the resin is super thin, so remember, it's barely thicker than a human cell. Bacteria are also not that much. But they're one cell, literally. Yeah, they're one yeah. cell. So uh, I would say some suspending them in the resin. And some of the work that Heinz and his team are continuing to work on at the moment is how do we best space the bacteria within that resin so that they can be most effect- uh, right. effective. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're creating this kind of film sheet of the bacteria. Yeah. Mm-hmm, so you can mm-hmm. pass something through it. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then there are also... Other things that they're continuing to work on is, could we get a better type of resin that would be more effective for particular purposes? Could we potentially include food in the resin so that the bacteria will live for longer? Um, and things and it, like that. And that's a really good example of how human beings can hack nature for productive purposes. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, because um, yeah, things that in, that in nature sit around doing nothing all day can actually be put to a really useful... Well, not nothing. It just doesn't... Yeah, nothing... Productive. Nothing that yeah. uh, does anything other than further the bacterial species yes, they belong yeah, to. Yeah. Uh, um, but, you know, can be put to actual productive use in, in you know, really achieving something. Yeah, I mean, right. this is a really cool example of, um, like, it's not biotechnology, I don't think, technically, but it's... No, it's not bioengineering, but it's, it's using nature to, you know, I mean, it's the same thing we've been doing ever since we domesticated you know, oxen and horses, but it, you know, it's using nature to progress, you know, p- produce and progress. And then I yeah. think that's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. You know, we can achieve it. And it's just amazing the new ways. We As I say, finding. it's just really cool yeah. too. <laughs> so that's one cool advancement. And another one that I think you had something to comment on as well is using it for housing. Yeah. I just, I simply had a note that that's a thing you can do. Yeah. It's, it's not just, there's two aspects to that. There's building components to be used in house building, and then there's actually printing whole houses, which is requires a very large printer. I yeah. have an example of both, actually. So, okay. um, so yeah, so using... There have only been a few houses that have been fully built by 3D printing so far, um, but I have... I assume they're not literally printing the whole house in one printer. I assume they're printing bits and then assembling them. So, as I said, I have two examples, and they're using kind of two different methods, so that's why I wanted to bring them both up. And also because they've actually built a few houses each, these companies. So there's a company called Icon in Austin, and they've put together about two dozen uh, 3D printed homes, and they have robots that use, that like, have 3D printers in them, basically, to layer... The house. Oh, so they're sort of driving around <laughs> building bits at a time. So that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah. and so the material they're using is called lavacrete, which is a proprietary it's material that... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's a proprietary material that they developed that's concrete with certain additives, and the purpose of those additives is to help the houses withstand um, earthquakes and extreme weather events. So it would be very useful in Tornado Alley, places like that, where, you know... It's, we always say in Europe, like, why do Americans build their houses out of wood when they get destroyed all the time by tornadoes? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Build it out of something that can actually withstand that. Yeah. Yeah. So the purpose of lava crate, and I mean, the houses they've built are relatively new, so I don't think they've been like stress tested yet. But yeah. the idea is, it's better structural integrity that will be able to withstand things better. Uh, and so those are using a robot, um, which does help help also avoid the labor crisis. That is a thing in the U.S. right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's that. People always talk about you know 
automation costing jobs, but when you're the other way around and there's not enough and there's not enough workers to do the jobs, yeah. Uh, so that's one solution in Austin, and then another company called Mighty Buildings. Um, mighty Buildings. Mighty Buildings. That is the name. Yes. Not mighty fine buildings, just mighty. Just buildings. mighty okay. buildings. They're they're nice and strong. Yeah. That's all that you're guaranteed. <laughs> Um, and so they do the other thing you're talking about of printing the parts that are then sent to the site and assembled by workers there. Yeah. Um, and so they print... Um, Giant Lego bricks that they could just... <laughs> no! <laughs> like, that would work, wouldn't it? But... <laughs> I mean, I guess you'd have to fill the blocks. Yeah. Anyway, um, in seriousness, they use artificial stone um, and a steel frame, and then they have insulation and then drywall for the inside. Right. So... And they also, these are meant to be uh, eco-friendly, so they have built-in solar panels and batteries to store. As we were talking about in our power generation episode, yeah. you have to store power for when the sun's not shining, so these yeah. have that built-in. For more discussion of solar panels, see previous episodes. Right, right yeah. yes. <laughs> and they have partnered with the Polari Group in California to build two subdivisions there. Um, I don't think it's completed yet. What was the subdivision? Uh, like an estate here. Oh, I suppose that's where the Rush Song subdivision comes from, doesn't it? Okay, yeah. That makes sense. Right. <laughs> so that's been translated for our British and American yeah. viewers. <laughs> so yeah, so basically the point is lowering costs and avoiding um, labor issues and housing are both valuable goals. And if you can get better structural integrity in the process, that's fantastic. And so yeah. there are companies working on doing that using 3D printing, which is really cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Did you have anything else? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so on the medical side of things as well, um, there's a group at a Harvard teaching hospital. I'm not sure if it's actually like on... On campus? I don't or... think it's literally on campus. I yeah. don't know if it's close to campus or not, but the hospital is called Brigham and Women's Hospital. And the team there is led by a Dr. Shriki Sang. I hope I'm saying that name right. Um and the technique they've developed is called cryobioprinting. Cryobio. Cryobioprinting. Okay. All one so word. So cryo implies cold. Correctly so, yes. Okay. So the idea is they take layers of stem cells. That's your input, is stem yeah. cells. Which we need to do a whole episode on because the we number really of things we've talked about that rely on stem cell technology. Well, and I've been hearing more and more like just anecdotal evidence of people whose friends, even one of our viewers left a comment about somebody they knew who benefited from a stem cell treatment. So right. yeah. it, it's really cool. Um, but basically they want to create implants that can be frozen until they're needed. Hmm. And so, so far they've only tested, um, for th freezing, freezing it for three months, but they don't see any reason why it couldn't be frozen for longer. Yeah. Um, and so they, their proof of concept that they created is 3d printing a muscle tendon unit. And the cool thing that they, um, we're not we're concerned about with this is that your tissues in your body, different part, they're not homogeneous. Or homogenous. Homogenous. That's how you, I was going to I don't think I'm saying that right. Homogenous. Uh, they're not homogenous. The tissues work differently in different parts of your body, and that's called ansiotropic right. is the proper term for that. And so the big question was when they 3D printed using these stem cells, would the uh, results be ansiotropic, like your actual tissues in your in your body? Hmm. And they were. So they t tested this with a muscle tendon unit for, for three months, and it was fine. Right. Uh, yeah, and so they're hoping that this could help people with degenerative di diseases who have tissues that are um, falling apart. Is not the right word. Deconstructing, de breaking yeah. down, having yeah. problems um, for replacements, uh, repairing injuries for drug research. If you could three D print the appropriate organ that you want to test on and test that before you test it on people, right? Yeah. Things like that. So that's their goal for um, for that particular technology they've developed there. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, slightly less medical, but still kind of, um, a team at the University of Arizona led by Philip Gruff, Gutruff, not Gruff, Gutruff, Good, right. um, have developed what they call a biosymbiotic device that's 3D printed. And so it's basically a cuff that would go really around any part of your body where it could just sit there. So it could go around, in the picture they had it around somebody's arm, but it could um, go around like your leg or your torso or whatever. And it's mesh and it can measure a whole number of things. They're hoping they've only tested it so far on athletic performances. So to see, you put it around your arm to see how your bicep is performing in a particular instance. Um, but they're hoping it could also be used to measure things like the advancement of certain diseases um, and things like that. It also, interestingly, it's not 
like a smartwatch because that was my first thought when I heard of this. Yeah, like a Fitbit. Or something. Right. Yeah. It's like okay, we have devices to measure. <laughs> Is the only advancement here that it's three D printed? But no, um, they also are uh, wirelessly charged, so you don't have to take it off and charge it. It gets its power just by being like you have the charging hey, unit like in your home. We've talked about this before. Haven't you? Wireless charging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think we did bring it up at one yeah. point. So that's another way in which that could help um, both help push people's achievement to their highest by helping uh, figure out for professional athletes what's going on and also helping people who have diseases just measure the onset of that disease. Awesome. Are you all done there? No. No. One more. <laughs> One more. <laughs> One more advancement in the realm of 3D printing is um, back to MIT. Hmm. Uh, they have been 3D printing different objects that collect data for them. So they... These are using what's called metamaterials, which is basically a grid of repeating cells that um, can include sensors. And so the idea is just to have more smart materials that collect information and can respond accordingly. So they can tell when you've touched them. So kind of like smart water that they use to catch thieves, where it's it's I'm capturing. Sorry? There's a thing called smart water where they, they put this liquid on surfaces and it catches fingerprints and things from thieves. I've, I've worked places that have used it. So really? I'm just, yeah, assuming it's a similar kind of principle to that. Okay, that's actually not how they described it being oh, used. Okay. Um, they were thinking more of measuring like small muscle movements or like in your furniture so that it can adjust to you. Like if you sit down, it will recognize you and kind of adjust right, for your okay. comfort. Um, so I don't think it catches fingerprints, but that's interesting as well. Intelligent memory foam. Yeah, yes. I'll have to find, yeah. Yeah, find that. Just find that and cover it somewhere else. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, that is all I had. So... Did you have anything else, or should we just no, I summarize? No, I think we're good to summarize there. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm not. What what is what can I summarize really? I sort of talk through the different methods of um, of 3D printing: SLS, SLA, uh, D, FDM, DLP, MJF, DM, SLS, and EBM. That won't mean much in That's summary. That's enough about soup. Yeah, you'll have to <laughs> jump jump back. Stereolithography, selective laser sintering, and fused deposition modeling being the main the main methods. Or, um, yeah, the sort of widely used ones. Um, and then uh, we talked around some of those applications and, and you know, ways in which it can enhance human flourishing. Talked about some of the potential risks, but uh, as I say, well, all new technologies carry risks, but usually a lot more reward. In fact, always, as far as I'm aware. And um, and then yeah, we finished up talking about your list of recent advancements and and you know forthcoming technologies. Yeah. So, um, so I think the the big thing to just wrap up is how is this going to help human flourishing. And yeah, we touched on that uh, uh, quite a bit already, I think, isn't it? You know, in increasing, cheapening and speeding up manufacture and also just increasing the range of what you can manufacture. Yeah, yeah, and, I mean, we discussed sort of some... democratising that in a way, like making it easier for smaller businesses and individuals to, you know, get into manufacturing things that would have required huge plants in the past. Yeah, it makes vertical integration possible. That's a good point. It makes vertic vertical integration possible for smaller businesses because, you know, in the past, to vertically integrate, you basically had to buy a business. Yeah. And if you instead just have to buy a machine and know how to work it, then... Yeah, it's like the Atlas Shrug thing, isn't it? Like, I couldn't get the copper, so I bought the copper mine. Exactly. Yeah, um, <laughs> you can do more things under one roof. Yeah, but that, yeah. that before was a thing that only big businesses or really rich people could do. And if it's now a matter of a couple of thousand, because I think the like smaller printers are running at about a couple of thousand now. In most cases. Yeah, as I say, I've got a friend who I... I, say, I, I, looked, so, one, yeah. I looked it up just for fun. He's one and, of my wealthier friends, <laughs> but yeah. Well, when I just did a quick Google just to see, like, how much do these run for for one that you could have at home, and it was in it was less than 10000 Right. So, so, yeah, it is aff yeah, affordable on a decent salary. Yeah. If you save up or are yeah. wealthy enough to not have to save up for a couple thousand yeah. dollar expenditure, yeah. Which a small business probably could manage in most cases yeah i was thinking in pound terms actually that's less than i realized so yeah if it's i don't remember which currency it was it was in sorry <laughs> that was in dollars then that, yeah but, um but yeah but lots yeah, of it's... really cool uh well, and, and, applications and and you know speeding up manufacturing sounds like a economic thing but just you know, remember the, the benefits that brings to everybody i mean time is your life well time is your life and also cheap cheaper products is better quality of life for people and you know that's yeah. it goes from you know, entertainment stuff right the way through to prosthetic limbs yeah cheaper products doesn't just mean better quality of life for the people who can already afford those things it means more people can have yeah, that exactly. quality of life yeah. because they can afford it so yeah. but it could also mean you know better rocket engines and aircraft and all sorts of things i mean i know it's been used in in railway locomotive manufacture and things like mm -hmm. that so 
Yes. It's also used for chocolate. And chocolate, if, yeah, wonderful. I will, I will have some 3D printed <laughs> chocolate at some point, I'm sure. That was developed by the University of Exeter <laughs> 10 years ago, but it's fun. That's awesome. All right. Well, I think that's all for today, then. Yeah. No, so, thank, uh, thank you Thank you for much. joining us yeah. on Innovation Celebration. Thank you.